Apothetheism. No, I didn't say that right. <laughs> <laughs> Apoth Apothesia. Ap <laughs> I could say it this morning. Apotheism. And no, I'm sorry. Apotheism. That's what it is. Sorry. Apotheism. <laughs> Apotheism. That's the word I wanted to say. Apotheism. Uh, this is in the uh, Christian Post. The rise of apathyism. I'm like, apathyism? Are these Christians making up new words? <laughs> what's, what's apathyism? Well, it turns out it is a word. A portmanteau of apathy and theism. The attitude of apathy towards the existence or non-existence of God. Apathy towards God. It's more of an attitude rather than a belief, claim, or belief system. The term was coined by Robert Nash, theology professor at Mercer University, 2001. Okay. An apathy, I think we know what apathy is, want of feeling, an utter privation of passion or insensibility to pain applied either to the body or the mind. Uh, so we have apathyism. Here in Christian Post, a newly released study from the Nashville-based Lifeway Research has found apathy inside the church was cited as the most common people dynamic challenge facing pastors today. Hmm. Now, do you think that would be one of the bigger challenges for, in the grace movement? Apathyism? I'm not sure. Uh, Lifeway's Greatest Needs of Pastors study asked a thousand Protestant pastors to identify the primary people dynamic challenges they face in their churches. The pastors were surveyed between March 30th and April 22nd of last year. Hmm. The overwhelming response, apathy or lack hmm. of commitment. The survey found that three quarters of pastors surveyed, 75% listed, people's apathy or lack of commitment when asked to identify the people dynamics they find challenging in their ministry. That was the only challenge that, that was the only challenge that more than half of pastors identified. These appear to be self-identified followers of Christ, apathetic to Christ's church. Coming in along second, third and fourth place in the survey were responses like, people's strong opinions about non-essentials. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. What Pray, amen what, for that. What color is the carpet going to be? Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Majoring on the minors, yeah. right? Resistance to change in the church. <laughs> yeah. And then the, uh, the the fourth one to hear was people's political views. Mm -hmm. uh, can be, this is a quote uh, from the uh, research, Lifeway Research Executive Director, Scott McConnell. He told the Christian Post, it can be easy for a church member to check the box and say, I'm doing some activities, I'm coming to church, and feel like they're doing enough, and yet, if they are not participating, they're really missing out on some pretty big parts. What's your reaction to that? Do you have one, Pastor? 
You think there's so much? Do you think apathy is a problem even in the grace movement? Yeah. Uh, I, I do. I, I would be tempted to think that uh, there's probably less apathy in the grace movement than you might find in well, many denominations. Now you're talking degrees. <laughs> now you're talking degrees. But is it? But is it? But is it still significant? Yes. It, yeah, I think it's a problem. Again, what's the opposite of apathy? Conviction. Passion. Right. Passion. Right. Commitment, and I would I would even throw the word in there involvement. Oh, I like that. Again, and the reason I would say it's an issue in the grace movement because grace churches suffer from the same lack of I'll call it the interbeliever dimension. The idea of you're going to church, not as much for what you get, but for what you can contribute. Oh, oh. And again, that oh. comes, you know, that comes from right out of Ephesians chapter four. When you when you read and study God's design for the church, the local assembly and how it's to function. And it's it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, chapter four and uh, chapter four, verse 15, I believe, if I remember right. Yeah. Talking about from Christ, the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. That's right. And so if the joints aren't supplying, then I would say that the, the, the biggest problem behind that is lack of conviction, lack of commitment, lack right. of involvement. Right. That's apathy. <laughs> Yeah. According to the effectual working and the measure of every part. Yeah. Well, every part is supposed to be working. <laughs> I would say if every part isn't working, the, 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 yeah, that's totally. a symptom of, of apathy, lack totally. of commitment, and lack of involvement. Totally. Making increase of the body under the edifying of itself of, in love. See, and that's the problem. People come to church, and they think all the edification is coming from that pulpit sitting over there. That's right. That's right. Now... I believe that edification is to come from that pulpit. Right. But I also believe that even as essential as that is, that involvement within the assembly is yeah. equally, if not even more important for right. the life of the assembly. Right. So, yes, I would say apathy is a big problem in, in so-called grace churches. Uh, again, we've bemoaned this. I mean, to, to many, the, the grace movement is more academic than it is practical. Right. The, um, uh, and and as, a, as a verse to some of them are more practical without, <laughs> yeah, yeah. without doctrine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, um, I, I love that. I, I was going to say something completely different. You, that, that was awesome. So it totally changed my mind. Uh, well, what, that well the other thing, and the other point I would make about that, I mean, <laughs> if I were a pastor and, and they were concerned about apathy, uh, if I were looking for a source of that, I, I would be looking in the mirror. Exactly. Uh, uh, well, and that, I mean, that kind of, uh, that response to me brings up the, uh, uh, a principle you taught me years ago on organic dynamics in the, mm -hmm. in the local assembly. Mm -hmm. And you look at something like uh, 1 Corinthians 12, mm -hmm. you know, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Mm -hmm. And so... And you go through this whole section, you know, if the foot shall say, because I'm not the yeah. hand, I am not of the body, all mm -hmm. that's talk there. Yeah. And you have in that section this interconnectedness of mm -hmm. everyone in the body, regardless mm -hmm. of where they are in the body or their role in the body or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we're not simply individual units, but living parts of an organic whole. So one of the benefits of coming to church is, right. is, 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 mm -hmm. That that beauty of unity, like that you might find in the in the human body, you you being edified and and it, it, you mm -hmm. edifying and being edified and encouraged and yeah. and um, mm -hmm. uh, sanctified, and you yeah. just get that spiritual nourishment through mm -hmm. that fellowship of the mystery in the mm -hmm. local assembly. You just can't mm -hmm. get anywhere else, right? And and again, why why the analogy or or the allegory of a body, right? Well, it, first of all, it indicates structure, right. Well, yes, yeah, structure, but it's a living structure. That's the reason it, it's the, the allegory is a body, because it's a living structure. 
And, you know, again, just as the Godhead, is he one or is he three? Yes. The human body, is it one member or many? Right. And it's the same way with the church. Right. We are members one of another. Right. Over right. and over again, the right. doctrinal position right. is we are one. Right. But the practical, right. the practical position is that we are many. Right. Now you have the Corinthians, you know, and all of us were instructed in that chapter, directed by the word of God, how we should view ourselves. We're not puffed up comparing ourselves amongst ourselves mm -hmm. as the Corinthians were doing, which brought about factions. But mm -hmm. God wants us to view ourselves properly as he sees us in Christ on the one hand and on the other hand as members of his body, organically united by the spirit and dependent upon one another. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me of Hal has an article on organic dynamics I think it's still on the church. It's on the church's website. Our um, uh, uh, our church's website. It'll eventually be on Supply of Grace. But the one quote I always loved about organic dynamics at the local assembly. It is said that the world's largest single organism is a stand of aspen trees, and each tree appears to stand alone. And yet, each tree is a member in an intricate symbiotic. Web of, a web of life organically bound at the roots. So similarly is the body of Christ. Each believer is one member of a complex organism mm -hmm. with a corporate life that emanates from its head, mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus Christ. In our union in Christ, we find nourishment, fruitfulness, aid, comfort, and safety. I mean, that is, I mean, if there is a, a cure for apathy, the, just the very way in which the local assembly operates mm -hmm. in terms of organic dynamics mm -hmm. is so satisfying. All right. Uh, it would be it would be difficult. I mean, mm. a lot of us should feel uh, that that warmth, that love, that belonging, um, and being a member of the body of Christ in that in that local assembly. Yeah. Well, I would say it's more than a feeling. Right. For like instance, that Boston song. If you could, every one of us has a, a a family unit of of some type. If someone in your family were experiencing whatever the difficulty may be, whether it's right. physical or whatever, we would be engaged not just because of our feeling, but because of our relationship. Yes, yes. And that is the same mentality that we should have within our assemblies. Yep. Uh, yes, we often see someone in a situation and we're empathetic, sympathetic, whatever the case, but are we engaged? Yes. That's the question. Yep. Now, I love I loved those points. Uh, now, I was thinking too uh, this morning as I was really going through that article was um, a lot of apathies can sometimes be top down in a local assembly from the, from the pastor down right. to everybody else. Right. Uh, the pastor can be burned out and might mm -hmm. somehow come across as being apathetic mm -hmm. uh, to our spiritual life, and it just filters down to, to the assembly. I think the same is true for love. That's why Paul mm -hmm. wanted Timothy to be an example of mm -hmm. love, because love top down yeah. in a local assembly. Well, and, I think that's one of the values that we have in having a multiplicity of... of well, a multiplicity of teachers, that's right. right. Because, yeah. again, a lot of times you may have, particularly in the grace movement, you may have an older pastor who's not necessarily right. less passionate, but his energy levels are certainly <laughs> right. not what they used to be. Right, right. The, the stamina, the... the uh, uh, right. You know, strength is not there. Right, right. And uh, so... You know, I think there's the more life there is in the assembly, the more life there is in the assembly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, enthusiasm so, breeds enthusiasm. Right. Apathy right. or or low activity breeds low activity. So I wanted to say, I mean, I wanted to say to some of these pastors uh, in the that had been surveyed, look, it's on you to help fight apathyism. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's on you. It's on you because. You know, uh, and, and there are there are many ways for uh, pastors that can screw that up. But um, you know, especially for the grace pastors, it's it's on you to help yeah. make it real yeah. to the people. It's yeah. on you to help make it personal yeah. to them. Help yeah. make them help make them passionate about the life of God inside of you. To be true helpers of their joy. Right. Um, but I also was thinking too this morning that you know another aspect of apathy in the local assembly. You know, every, all these pastors who have been surveyed, they're all denominational pastors, mm -hmm. and I'd argue they have one or maybe both hands tied behind their back, 
in terms of, of having the tools needed to help instill passion in the hearts of their uh, uh, members mm. of, of their congregation because they don't have the sound doctrines of grace to teach right. them. And I don't know, and I think God has mm. already probably, he has done everything under the sun that he could do to fight apathy with right. how excellent the mm. entire program of grace is. It is beyond, I mean, just amazing beyond words with all the, how he saves us, everything he made us in his son and literally giving us all things i mean how much more excellent can you make the program of grace you just can't do it and so god has given you all the tools necessary to help make it real to the people get them excited Mm -hmm. about grace and get them and get them Mm -hmm. get their fire lit underneath them passionate about the very fact he had the god of the universe his life is inside of you yeah because he loves you that's amazing (laughs) well Again, you mentioned I, denominational churches. Uh, I would say it's also a product of their education. So yeah. they come from a school, they come from a denomination, they have a, a certificate of ordination, they have a degree from a university or a college or something of that nature. Right. And so when they want to look at what they consider to be a successful assembly, they go to the most successful in whatever their affiliation would be. And then their idea is to try and mimic. It is right. to try and recreate. And of course, the majority of the time is through programs or gimmicks right or something of that nature right and uh so uh again (laughs) we don't we don't believe that much in in programs and gimmicks uh program there's nothing wrong with programs right totally uh, because uh, again it gives a a platform for people to be engaged with one another and, and and do different things but the substance of the assembly can't be the programs itself right right exactly uh, I think too. You, uh, you know, you have the structure of the local assemblies. Second, Second Timothy two two. You you raise up men in that assembly to teach, learn, so that they can learn how to teach. Yeah. Well, there's something to be said about the guy who thinks he's been called by God to be a pastor. He goes to school. He's got ten degrees, mm. and uh, there is a you know a complacency in, perhaps in his attitude. He. You know, he is uh, all sufficient to be able mm-hmm. to lecture people in terms of what they're supposed to think and do. Uh, he mm-hmm. expects God to do a lot of this stuff for him. Well, and compared to the guy who came from nothing, mm-hmm. who is hungry, who wants to serve God to his fullest, and he wants that position yeah. badly. Of course, we would, we would say that the person that thinks he's been called by God into that particular position uh, <laughs> already is be- beginning from a point of delusion. Right, right. Right, right, exactly. he's, he's, he's operating off a product of his imagination. Right. You know, uh, the, he, he, Paul was very clear. He said, if a man desire the office of a bishop. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. Take, give me that guy yeah. who hit bottom and he's hungry. Yeah. He's hungry and he wants to serve God yeah. deeply. Yeah. And give, then he calls that, that a good work. Over, over the guy with 10, ten master's yeah. degrees in seminary. Yeah, he desires the good work. There right. is a guy that's interested right. in rolling up his sleeves right. and, and doing what needs to be done. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Not, not being the guy that stands up front and says, you go do this, and you go do this, and you go do that. Right, right. There's a difference. And I don't know, and then when you think about gen- individually, the sound doctrines of grace, I mean, God gives you on a golden platter the best news you can actually offer your yeah. congregation mm-hmm. in order to give give them joy in their life, yeah. to make them praise God for everything, mm-hmm. to change their thinking to one of, of endless gratitude, mm-hmm. and and then just light their fire to make them want to right. dig into His Word, to get to know mm-hmm. God better, yeah. to, to to have um, to have a healthy relationship with Him, in order to appropriate all of those attributes mm-hmm. you already have yeah. in you. And then you've, and then you know, it's almost like you're personally challenged by mm-hmm. God to live a life of holiness because He has told you you're freed yeah. from sin. So you think that's more effective than uh, snappy music with drums and, and <laughs> electric guitars? I'll take I'll take identification over anything under the sun. Absolutely, there's no way I could have it without yeah. right division. Right. You know? There's no, and, and, you know, you, you, we had articles last week we mentioned about youth wanting to be challenged. What greater challenge can you give a kid than to say, yeah. hey, you've been freed from sin. Yeah. Now live a life free from it. Let me see you mm-hmm. do that. 
Rather, because out in Christianity, the vast majority of their dialogue is following Christ, doing what he does, all this stuff. Christ says, uh uh. He says, You are one with my son. You are dead, buried, and risen with him. And let me tell you what I made you in my, in my son. You are literally, the old Jew is gone forever. You're literally freed from sin. Now, go run that race. Mm hmm. You know, that's right. amazing. Yeah. That's, that's unbelievable. I mean, there is no denomination. There is not one church on the planet that can give greater news to the to you, to the people of your congregation than the church that understands the word rightly divided right. and understands the sound mm -hmm. doctrines of grace, yeah. especially identification. Yeah. Uh, it's, and the, and the, the odd reality is, is that as much as so many of these denominations think they're sharing good news with their people, it doesn't. It, it, that is just mm. a shadow of the real good news that God has in store right. for all of them that He wants them to know. Well, again, mankind basically, uh, I find, has this desire to have a connection with God. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. They 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 hunger for feeling. A personal right. connection with God. The, right. the problem is, most of the way that most organized religion approaches that is on the basis of feeling. Right. Now, I remember I was, again, I trusted Christ when I was 12 years old and, and, and immediately had a, a thirst and a desire to read the Word of God. Number one, I wanted to understand the book that I had in my hands. But number two, I was also seeking a direct connection to God himself. Mm. And so over time, it, it was the word of God that became my connection, not the way that I was feeling about my relationship with God, but by what I was reading and understanding. Mm -hmm. Because to me, when I, when I was reading that book, God was speaking to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, let, and let's face it, if the only time God speaks to you is when the guy's open his mouth is standing behind the, the pulpit, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's, you're, yeah, you're, totally. you're, you're, you're not, you're getting it through a filter. That's right. That's right. That's right. And far less impactful than you spending time directly with the word yourself. Absolutely. Far less impactful. Yeah. Uh, it's important. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll guide you. Gives you a lot of, gives you mm -hmm. a lot of great uh, direction in your life, mm -hmm. but that nothing yeah. compares to being yeah. alone with his word, one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. Yeah. Nothing compares to that. Yeah. Uh, well, again, and I've asked a number of people over the years the idea, when was the last time that you were in your Bible and, and a verse so hit you that you wept from the joy of the understanding? I don't think that's ever happened to me. <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> I, I'm thrilled to death about everything, but I never wept from it. Yeah. Uh, my my reaction well, is to, my reaction is, is fine. Is l l wanting to leap yeah. with joy for the most part. You yeah, know? exactly. I, I'm I'm leaping out of bed, really excited about yeah. you know my life of yeah. grace, everything God's done for yeah. me. That makes me excited, but I don't. Mm -hmm. Nothing's ever made me. Well, I, w I would say the times that that happened to me were with verses that just. Did this for so long, and then yeah, all and of then a, you finally get it. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's it's you know it's like the the clouds break and the sun comes in through the window, and you know you hear this big glorious music in the background. <laughs> the birds you? are singing. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> that that uh, uh, that that is what happened to me when I came to finally understand identification, yeah. and I could understand verses like Philippians three ten and yeah. eleven. You know. Uh, attaining unto the resurrection of the dead, uh -uh, I did not get that ever yeah. until yeah. until I fell and came back, mm -hmm. and you guys taught me identification. I mean, one of the first verses I ever m memorized was Galatians two twenty and twenty one, right. and I had no idea what, what it, it meant. meant. Yeah, right, right, right. I was just told you need to memorize this verse. Yeah, but those that would tell me that never told me why. <laughs> <laughs> and they certainly never said anything about identification. Well, and how can you look at that verse and not even and think not about get that? identification? Yeah, Give know. it to a denominationalist, and they'll show you how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Um, all right. Well, uh, now you guys out there, uh, what are your thoughts on apathy? Do you have any? On top of that, I've got a bazillion phenomenal uh, Grace articles to share. Uh, th everybody was fantastic. I've got I've got too many too many great things to talk about today. I uh, love to hear your thoughts. Happy Monday. How you doing, Pastor? Oh, I'm happy and handsome. Yes, yeah, I, know. I know. I know exactly what you're. I was going to say alive and kicking. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't say kicking very high. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by the way, this is the Grace Life Podcast. <laughs> I'm some guy named Joel. This I'm the lowly associate pastor here at Fellowship Bible Church. Oh, by the way, there was an article here. Mm. I saw this last night, Pastor. You, you, there was um. Uh, it was in the Christian News. I got, I got to tell you about the kidney article real quick. ChristianHeadlines.com. Um, I just, I'm just throwing this out there. Freddie, you listening? This article is called We're in This Together. Ne- Nebraska pastor to donate kidney to associate pastor. Just pointing it out. <laughs> in case there's any health issues with your associate pastor, yeah, just yeah. pointing that out. You uh, know. <laughs> uh, why, do you need a kidney? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm surprised mine's still working, frankly. Uh, um, uh, I'm, and this is uh, Pastor Hal Beckemeyer uh, to my left, the uh, Dean of Theology of the Beckemeyer Grace School of Hard Knocks. <clears throat> and uh, yes, there's only one student to this school, uh, and he is struggling mightily with uh, in his studies on the end times and the end of the world. Um, hey, we got a bunch of links beneath the video, including a link. There is a book about identification. If you didn't know what we were talking about, uh, there's a book about identification mm-hmm. that uh, you can, right here. Is where, it written by anybody we know? No, uh, nobody. Nobody. The, the person's not uh, is, is worth is not worth mentioning, but. The the subject about which the book uh, was the what the book's about is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> the identification in and of itself is a doctrine so essential to your spiritual life to understand everything you are in Christ. Um, beautiful, it is a doctrine that that goes to the core of your being that gives you joy, peace. Uh, makes you want to leap out of bed with absolute gratitude to the Father every single day of your life. I kid you not. And it helps you to understand how to function as a believer in order to serve Him as He would have you serve Him. And there's no way you can do that without actually first reckoning some of the truths in that book. Like the fact that you are literally freed from sin. Because if you're dead, buried, and risen with Christ, if the old Jew's been crucified with Christ, and that old man is D-E-A-D, dead, as Bob Picard would say, then you must also be freed from the power and the dominion of sin. How can you not? For he that is dead is freed from sin. Um, I actually got a big article on uh, identification I want to share that I thought was, uh, 50% was amazing. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, and uh, we've got a, there's another link to another page on our website called, uh, so check out the book. Get, get yourself a copy of the book. If you, if, you, if, you, if you don't have the money, you can go to our, our, our website, our church's website, and download a copy for free as a PDF. You're welcome to have it as free. I care more about the message than I do about uh, the sales. Uh, we've got also beneath the video a link to a page on our website where you could financially support the uh, ministry here. If you appreciate guys like Hal getting up in the morning, driving out here, to sit down and answer our questions and, and talk Bible stuff with us almost every day. Um, and you can help support this uh, ministry. We could use your help. So uh, it's, through, it's through PayPal, or you can send a check or money order to payable to the church. Uh, what else we got here? I got a bunch of links beneath the video. All these links to articles, I'm going to totally, we're going to totally hopefully get to those today. I got to see who's in the house here. And uh, by the way, you might remember the... Um, uh, this is the uh, this this is um, the last week we're going to have Hal for about a month, and uh, you got to come up with the most painfully difficult questions that you can. Uh, I can say I don't know with the best of them. Um, yeah, or I don't remember. <laughs> I'm stalling because I'm having issues here. All right, uh, let's see here. We've got Damon Chin in the house. How you doing? Good morning. Damon Chen quotes Ephesians 1 6 to the praise of the glory of his grace, grace. wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Uh, I remember, I could be wrong, but I remember, I think it was J.C. O'Hare would, used to say that accepted was, um, I mean, it's nothing wrong with that translation. It's just, uh, it was a word they chose because there's no verb form of grace in the English. Uh, that uh, you have, a, which is what, apparently what you have in the Greek, and it's you're essentially graced into the blood. Yeah. Um, which I love, which is the same thing as being accepted, essentially. Um, but you have here to the praise of the glory of his grace. Yeah. You're not praising his grace, the glory of his grace. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. The glory of his grace. Yeah. I, I think I used to have a saying that I use it's not the steak, it's the sizzle. 
yeah. The the glory of His grace would have to be the Lord Jesus Christ, I would think. Yeah. You know, essentially, He is the glory of God. Right. Yeah. Right. The express image. Right. Right. An expression here that essentially. The glory of His grace. I mean, His grace is glorious, and, and the, but the very reason that we even have His grace is because of His Son. Yeah. Um, mm. That's an amazing thought. To the praise of the glory of His grace. We could mm. probably riff on that for an hour. Mm. Uh, hey, we got Lourdes in the house. How you doing? Jerry Winehouse, and good to see you. Donnie Holt. I got, a, I got a link to a Donnie Holt message down there. Donnie Holt was talking about, uh, let's see here. What, was, what were you talking about yesterday, brother? Uh, he had a message on, um, where are you at? Where are you at? Oh, proper faith. That's right. Because I hate improper faith. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a great message, dude. I hope you're doing great. But yeah, Donnie Holt, dude, go look, look for Donnie. He's right underneath uh, Randy White when Randy White asked, uh, should Christians fast? <laughs> mm. Do you think Christians should fast? That's an interesting question. Uh, it's not a matter of should, but they are welcome to do it if they I want. I fast, but uh, not for religious reasons. Right, right. Not because I'm a Christian. Fasting is healthy and it's good for you. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, how does the intermittent, fa intermittent fasting... Um, and uh, I love intermittent fasting. I know I know a number of people that are doing that. Donnie Holt, good to see you. Lion of Judah, what's the word? Uh, the apostasy is out of hand. Terrible pastors and teachers putting people under law, etc. Rapture has to be imminent. Yep. Well, um, <laughs> that's been going on since Paul. I agree with him, though. I agree. Yeah. It's got to be imminent. Even if I'm wrong, I'm right. Yeah, that, exactly. That reminds me, because <laughs> Paul said it, and he was right. <laughs> uh, you know what? That comment reminds me of Bob Picard's article, which I thought was awesome, talking about the apostasy. Um, you, uh, Bob had an article that came out over the weekend called People are People. I love this article. I love Josh's article, too, and we'll get to that eventually. But... Well, first thing he's talking about people are people. Uh, how do, you know they're all different, but they're all kind of the same. <clears throat> but then talking about, he says uh, that said, every person has a different physical makeup as well as a different spiritual makeup or acumen. That's why it's so hard, so important to stick with a literal biblical interpretation rather than the pop popular allegorical needs based view. Going back to the, apo the apostasy and the bad teaching that Lion of Judah is, is talking about here, Bob said, so many use scripture, mostly verses taken out of context, as a sort of talisman mm -hmm. that brings special power to the one in possession of it. I love that. This power is the so-called key to overcoming every felt need, problem, and woe that one faces in this life. You know, what type of Goliath are you facing in your life? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. man, I have seen yeah. those messages online. All you have to do is put your particular problem you are facing mm -hmm. in place of Goliath. Perhaps you are facing the Goliath of drug addiction. Well, by golly, all you have to do is follow the three bullet points I have for you. <laughs> Perhaps you have the Goliath of a bad marriage. <laughs> mm -hmm. He says I could go on and on. But it's not about our life now, best or otherwise. The Christian life is about looking vertically rather than horizontally. Mm -hmm. And he says... And he, of course, he cites Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Yep. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And he says, because people are people. The Christian minister in no way has access into the very depths of man. Uh, I don't know. 
there is a, no other person beside the individual himself that knows what's inside of him. As a matter of fact, someone can actually appear to be engaged in a church service, but inside that person is out to lunch, thinking of the <laughs> roast that is in the oven or the ball game that is happening later. He knows yeah. what's inside of him. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit also has access into the cranial depths, <laughs> and it is the scriptures which the Spirit works in conjunction mm. with. Uh, of course, he quotes 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Simply put, we try to figure people out when we have no clue what is going on inside of them. Let us stick to preaching and teaching the word of truth. As it is written, without trying to customize or change scripture to meet the needs of people. And he quotes Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. Or John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, if the word of God is powerful enough for those who are laboring to enter into rest, how much more powerful is it for those who who have already entered into rest and are seated in heavenly places mm -hmm. in Ephesians 2.6. Um, and he, he go, it's, it was a beautiful article. He quotes uh, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God's quick and powerful. Mm -hmm. To the false prophets, Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 23.29, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord. Uh, and he says the word of God is sufficient for the believer today. It needs no help and absolutely no embellishment. The word stands on its own. It is a sad state we are in when the Bible takes a backseat to worldly philosophies and practices. It's up to us to boldly proclaim the word of God. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. You like that? I, yeah. Well, I, 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 I get these cravings now for Bob Picard articles. You know, <laughs> uh, I love that, Bob. You did a beautiful, beautiful job. Uh, Josh Strelecki has a real good one, too. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, hey, we got Carl Coates in the house. How you doing, my dear brother? Uh, Kay Dico, she says, good, joyous morning, our mad, bad, precious, precious, really, pastors Joel Hal and beautiful precious. Maryland, <laughs> all the FBCO uh, saints, grace, peace, big tight hugs, and so much love. Mm. All the love in the world right back at you, Kay. Yeah. Hey, we got Bob Picard. Hey, I was, were your ears bleeding, or, uh, uh, what, what, actually, uh, ears ringing? No. I forget how this saying goes. Well, hey, we were talking about you. Burning. Burning, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Amy Stewart's in the house. You beautiful sister, what's going on? And we got Cliff Matthews. Uh, uh, let me see here. He says, Brian had quite the cliffhanger, eh? Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? I didn't hear Brian yesterday. Uh, Joel was uh, spent yesterday working on the end of the world in chronological order, uh, which is uh, very, very difficult. I didn't get to hear him. I did hear. Um, I did hear Jordan. Jor the Sorewood posted a bunch of a bunch of uh, videos lately, and, and I heard Jordan. Um, which one was it? Uh, what about the Hebrew epistles? That's what it was. Mm. And the um, and he makes the point. He says uh, he he had made a suggestion that you know we often say you know not everything is not. Uh, uh, all the Bible's written for us, but not all of it's to us. I think is what, what, how we mm -hmm. used to say it. And he suggested we should say it. not all of it's, not all of it's. Uh, uh, oh, how's that phrase go? <laughs> I'm having real troubles this morning. Uh, it's all written about. Instead of saying it's not written to us, it's not written about us. Yeah. Um, it's all for us. Yeah. But it's not about us. Right. It's not all about us. That that's that's a good point. I I, I thought so too. Uh, I added that to my list of mm -hmm. revisions to the book because I, I I said to us in the book, mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's a great point yeah. because if you think about like um, the end of you know Ephesians, uh, Romans four, the story of Abraham's ver of conversion was written for us. Yeah. In the Bible, yeah. that story, that Old Testament mm -hmm. story, was written for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you had what was it? First Corinthians uh, ten talking about Moses. You can mm -hmm. learn. Moral uh, principles from studying the Old Testament. Okay. Right. You know. Well, also you learn a great deal about the the nature and character and identity of God as you read these passages. Right. Um, did we talk about too? What is it? Is wasn't it? Um, 
Romans 15, uh, uh, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Now that's the, the point of reading the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is to increase your hope. Mm. To understand the, the end result of, of the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Yeah. We're just reading the Old Testament gives you hope because God, the God of today is the same God of time past. And seeing the fulfillment mm -hmm. of his promises in time past is, 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 mm -hmm. another, is, is a way in which we increase our hope in him and, and rejoice and find comfort in the scripture. Well, obviously, if he doesn't honor those promises, what confidence would we have that he would right. honor any to us? Amen. Amen. And yeah. if the, um, so I, that's another that's another wonderful point i you know we often quote the first half of fifteen four. you know when talking to each other whatsoever things are written for our learning no 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 you got to finish that verse that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope mm -hmm. there's there's a point that why it was written for our learning there is there is something that you gain out of that study mm -hmm. don't get me started <laughs> mm. um Cliff Matthews says, uh, let me see here. Hi, Bob. Hey, it's good to see you, brother. All right. Uh, Lori Loves Green is in the house. I heard Jan is going up to Alabama soon. Very excited about that. Excited for her. I hope you're doing great. Uh, who else do we have here? Chris Nelson, my mad, bad back brother out there in Utah. Good to see you, dear brother. Uh, what else do we have? Amy Stewart says, uh, praise the Lord for the hungering of the word he gives the saints. Yes. I, uh, it was not until I, uh, I wasn't until the, um, I, I hit bottom and I really needed his word to survive. Uh, did I really have that hunger for the word? And I, and mm -hmm. I got to that point where I just couldn't even walk away from, I had a hard time being mm -hmm. away from my Bible. Um, and uh, I still do. I still, I, I, if I'm, I'm happiest when I have the Bible in front of me and I'm preparing, working on something. Um, Amy Stewart says, patiently, patiently waiting for my book still. Good. Hey, we got Dave. <laughs> uh, we got Dave Perry in the house. My dear brother. How you doing? Good to see you. All right. So we got a DJ Sun time. Mm. Are everyone's sin forgiven or just believers? I'll give that one to you, Hal. Well, Scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ was the pr propitiation for the sins of the world. Um, he paid for them all. Uh, the uh, I would say those who come to Christ in faith, as mm -hmm. sins are forgiven. Um, um, the uh, but the point is, if you do come to Christ in faith and you and you do accept Him as your yeah. Savior, and yeah. what He accomplished at Calvary, Colossians two thirteen, having forgiven you all trespasses. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, what else do we have here? We got Justin Cox. How you doing? Good to see you. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, Lori says, uh, getting better every day. We get closer to going home, brother. Thanks for asking. How are you? Uh, it certainly feels like we're going, getting closer to going home, does it not? Well, um, I'm 72 years old. I'm definitely closer to going home than, <laughs> than, than a lot of people. Uh, there was uh, every time. Every time I prep for uh, the uh, uh, um, prep for the podcast, there's always some new thing, some new thing that's going to um, uh, makes us think that we're closer to the uh, end times. And as of late, there was the. Uh, articles about this British microchip implant in your hand where you can swipe your hand to have pay to, to, to make payments now. Um, the sounds, sounds like fun. <laughs> sounds to me like we're getting ever closer to the, yeah. to the, to our yeah. um, appointed yeah. uh, day of uh, catching away the church. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there was yeah. some, it was an article. And yeah. by w the way, if I get that chip, I plan on leaving it behind. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what would what would actually be better than a chip? A mark. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there was an article in WND, and then there was uh, uh, CBN had an article, too, about these uh, microchip. I think it's called WalletMore, and uh, people are getting it. It's a new comp- newest company that you, you put this chip in your hand between your thumb and your finger, and you just uh, your hand could be swiped. Uh, you can pay with your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. That doesn't make you wonder how much close we are to, to going mm-hmm. home. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, Justin Cox says, uh, great to hear Lori. Uh, going home sounds great. Hope it's, hope it's soon. I'm doing fine working, uh, needing some time, good quiet time with the word been lacking lately. I understand that. I understand that. Nothing better in the world. Um, uh, what else do we have? We've got, uh, Lori says, praise the Lord. Always can use quiet time with the word in this busy, sin-cursed world. Amen. Uh, Lori says, yes, uh, Janet hopefully is bringing all the hugs from y'all. That's what we told her to take up there with her. All is very well with my soul, Justin. Thank you very much. Kay says, excellent. Uh, all right, so here's, let me get into an article I loved. 50% of it was excellent. <laughs> uh, I have not so much But I love this brother So I'm going to bite my tongue uh, This is um, uh, um, This is by Kevin Sadler We're gonna, uh, this, uh, talks about, this is from a 2019 conference That he gave in Inverness uh, And this is all about Sanctification by grace And Kevin actually dives into Identification and the section that he talks about identification was fantastic. And if I, if I had known about this message uh, years ago, I would have uh, done some quotes and added it to the book. This is a year before the book came out, a year and maybe four months before the book came out. So um, th- that, the part about identification was fantastic. I will bite my tongue about the section where he talks about the old man still being alive, and I'm not going to read it, and I'm not going to go off on it. I'm just going to praise him for the part that was good. <laughs> oh. But you have a section here, and I loved some of these. He actually quotes some guys, and I loved it. Uh, so, of course, he goes to, uh, by grace, we are baptized into Christ. Okay, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know ye not. So many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Yeah. Therefore... We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay. We know that, we know that, docs, we, we know those verses well. Kevin writes, and by the way, Kevin is president of the Brian Bible Society. That's where we get stamps, things that differ, some of the classic books. It's a, basically a publishing house uh, for mid Acts believers. Uh, they're all about getting the word out about the distinctiveness of Paul's apostleship. Uh, so he says, Christian living depends on Christian learning. Duty is founded on doctrine. Love that. Yep. If Satan can keep believers ignorant, he can keep them weak. True. Our sanctification is based on what we know. And Paul asked, know ye not? So a couple of paragraphs later, he says, uh, Romans 5, 8 teaches Christ died for us. Whereas Romans 6, 3 teaches that we died with Christ. I love that. So then he quotes a guy by the name of John Gregory Mantle. And this is what he wrote. He once wrote, and this was, and this is, okay, John Gregory Mantle. This was quoted by DeHaan in an article about Galatians 2.20. <laughs> Strangely enough. Strangely and this is, enough. And this is what Mantle wrote. He says, There is a great difference between realizing on that cross he was crucified for me, and on that cross I am crucified with him. Mm-hmm. The one aspect brings us deliverance from sin's condemnation, the other from sin's power. All right. That is awesome. I yeah. love that quote. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord for whoever this mantle is. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, all right. So he, he goes into how baptism, he, you know, talks about a baptism as a means of identification. Okay, great. And he says this leads Paul into the, the second step in his logic. 
If believers were baptized into Christ and joined to him completely, then we are also united with his death. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And because we are united with his death, then we are united with his burial. Mm -hmm. And because we are united with his death and burial, mm -hmm. we are joined to and united with Mm -hmm. His resurrection, and therefore we can and should walk in newness of life. That's the logical sequence of thought. Exactly. Right. Take that logic right. to the next step. If you're dead, buried, and risen with Christ, the old man can't, could not survive mm -hmm. a death, burial, and resurrection with Christ. But mm -hmm. I'm, I, 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 I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But he says the believer is united with Christ, so God counts what happened to Christ as having happened to us. Exactly. God established this unit. We are, I'm sorry, God established this union. We are in Christ. His death is our death. His burial is our burial. His resurrection is our resurrection. His newness of life is our newness of life. And then you have this fantastic paragraph here. Thus, when Paul asked, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It refers to death with Christ when he died. Christ's death is applied to us now. But because Christ died once for all in the past, and we were united to that, our death to sin happened to God's way of seeing things on the day Christ died. Thus the instruction is not a present, progressive, ongoing tense. We are dying to sin. It is not a future tense. We will die to sin. It is not an imperative, die to sin. Nor is it an exhortation, you should die to sin. It is a final past tense, you died to sin. sin. Yep. I love that. Absolutely. I love that. Yep. He's, he's just got, he's right on here about uh, being dead to sin. Okay. If you're dead to sin, the old man's got to be dead too, yeah. just saying. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's such a truth to realize. The Lord Jesus Christ paid for all the sin for all men of all time on Calvary's cross. Right. And yet his death is not automatically our death. Not everyone died in Christ. One of the things that we read in Romans chapter 6, <laughs> that we have to be baptized into his death. Right. So his death doesn't become our death until we are spiritually baptized, spa right. spir baptized into Christ. I exactly. Yeah. And, right. and not only that, I was thinking also of, of, of uh, Galatians 3.27. And he said, for as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. I had that in my book. Yep. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um I love that point. Thank you, Pastor. The, um, uh, there's a couple of other really good paragraphs, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the simple truth is that he says that if you are a believer, you have already died to sin. It's a past event and yep. an accomplished fact. It means that now and forevermore, mm -hmm. you are set free from the ruling power of sin in your life by the cross of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, having been crucified with Christ, we are to move forward with knowledge of this unchangeable truth. So that we might not live in sin any longer. Through mm -hmm. our union and identification with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, we are now dead to sin and alive to God. What Paul wanted believers to know is that when we believe the gospel, even though we didn't see it, hear it, or feel it before God, we were made one with Christ by the spirits baptizing us into him. And at the same time, we were also united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now... His death is my death. His resurrection is my resurrection. His victory over sin is my victory over sin. His triumph over death is my triumph over death. He is my life. His resurrection power is my power, which he wants me to use to live a life that glorifies him. This is practical sanctification. It is made possible entirely by grace. Love that. Now, if you guys read that article, just stop there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
uh, uh, but he gets it so well. And, you know, this is the thing. The, and I suspect what got me on that identification path for me was Ed Bedore. I read an article of his. He says his death became my death. His burial became my burial. Mm-hmm. His resurrection became. I was like, I'm missing something here. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't understand what he's talking about here. This I need to know. Mm-hmm. And I'll bet and Ed Bedore was his teacher uh, at BBI. So, um, you know, I, it does not surprise me at all that he, uh, Sadler, would uh, get so well identification here. Um, it started with probably Ed Bedore for him. Ed Bedore was just the first of many people I read and studied in order to finally wrap my head around it until I finally came to the understanding, oh, I get it now. And it changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. What a better, what better way to, to fight apathy? <laughs> That's, that was the point. Yeah. yeah. I was, well, I, I changed my mind about the, what we were going to talk, uh, how, how we were going to do it because... In the opening monologue, I was going to re- talk about that, talk with you about apathy, then read this article what, and mm-hmm. say what better way to fight right. apathy than identification. But right. I don't know. Your thoughts were so good about organic dynamics, I couldn't resist. But yeah, that, yeah. Was, that, was, the, that was the idea. Well, see, that's the thing. So many people think the idea of a, I'll use the expression, a righteous life, if you will, uh, is futile to think that, that we can even do that. Right. I love this man will quote too. On that cross, he was crucified for me, and on that cross, I am crucified with him. There is a great big difference between those two thoughts. Mm-hmm. He is absolutely right. I love, and you meditate, you know, that is a great thing to meditate on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Have you, and, and he says, the one aspect brings us deliverance from sin's condemnation, right? His crucifixion for me, and the other from sin's power, my crucifixion with him. Mm-hmm. You know, your crucifixion with him is what frees you from sin's dominion because if you're dead, buried, and risen with Christ in that spiritual sense, you have to be freed from the power and the condemnation of sin because right. he that is, Paul tells you why in, in Romans 6 7, he that is dead is freed from sin. You know, if you die, you are, your soul leaves the body and you're freed from that sin corrupted mm-hmm. body yeah. for the rest of eternity. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, mm-hmm. you're freed from sin's power after that. Mm-hmm. And now, the moment you believe, you are in God's mind through that baptism of the Spirit, mm-hmm. identified with his death, burial, and resurrection, which means he sees you as dead, buried, and risen with his, cro- with mm-hmm. his son. Mm-hmm. And thus, if you've already died, then you must by necessity be crucified with Christ and you must by necessity be risen with him and that means that you are right here right now in your sin corrupted body literally already freed from the power and the dominion of sin over your soul Mm -hmm. and so after you get saved sin becomes a choice in your life you you either choose to yield to his righteousness through the teaching of the spirit in the study of his word or you choose to go after the fulfilling the lust of the flesh when you're tempted to do whatever. Mm-hmm. I think it's, um, God's program is absolutely brilliant. And I don't know of a greater challenge to your life, you, especially a young person out there. You want a good challenge to your life? Yeah, live mm-hmm. a life free from sin. Yep. Let me see you do that, big guy. <laughs> Bring it. Run that race. I dare you. And when you understand identification, does it not even give you great motivation to run the race? Mm-hmm. It's just, it's not, most people are just walking down that track. Yeah. Identification makes you want to run as yeah. fast as you can. How perfect can you align that earthly walk with your heavenly identity? How perfect can you manifest holiness in every day in your life? I mean, the possibilities are endless in terms of how well you can serve the Lord. Mm. Once you understand who you are in Christ. And it's no wonder Paul says to run the race. I don't hear any apathy in your voice. <laughs> you, you're kind of fired up this morning. I get me started. Yeah. <laughs> well, I see identification lights my fire, obviously. And uh, that's, why, that's why I wrote this book. You got to read the book if, um, if you want to have a really good, thorough understanding of what I'm talking about, which for me is a gigantic celebration of everything everybody in grace has, has ever said about identification. And uh, I just, uh, that, that is the truth that I want everybody to understand. You understand what salvation is. You come to him in faith, accepting his death, burial, and resurrection as a payment for all your sins. You, be- you believe he died for you to pay for all your sins. You trust in that by faith. The Father will give you that free gift of eternal life. Mm-hmm. Great. Then what do you do after that? How do you live? 
you know, and then the first thing Paul teaches you after he gives you the gospel in Romans 6 is he teaches you what God made you in his son. Yep. It is the, the same tenets you accepted by faith that got you saved. Father now says, okay, all those things that you believe by faith that got you saved, now I want you to accept those same tenets for yourself. I want you to see yourself as dead, buried, and risen with my son, mm -hmm. which clearly uh, encapsulates the perfection of what he has made you in his son that moment you believe. Yep. That's um, the layout in Romans, or of course, 6, 7, and 8, uh, Talking about our identification, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Dispensational <laughs> the, truth, I guess. Well, well, I would say, uh, by the way, unless you misunderstand what I'm teaching you in Romans 6, 7, and 8, <laughs> you are not Israel. <laughs> right. and, and, and then, of course, by the time you get to Romans 12, he says, now that you understand all of this thing, you're not Israel. Uh, you, <laughs> you have practical righteousness as well as positional righteousness. You have the, the, the life of Christ in you. Now you should present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Amen. So now he gets to service. Come on, give it to me. Why didn't he start with service? <laughs> you don't start with service. He's, <laughs> he starts with justification, goes to identification, makes the proof that you're not Israel, and then he tells you, now go do something right, with it. Right, 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 right. Which, which, you know, doctrine is the motivation. It is the, right. it is the thing that lights the fire. Mm, doctrine yeah. is, the, is the reason why you would want to serve yeah. him. Well, um, people, you know, many people want to start with Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Right. Without having gotten through Amen. the information that comes right. before that. Right, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, honestly, I don't know of anything more liberating. Apart from you have eternal life through the gospel. That's liberating. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then you also have... The realization that n very few people understand out there that not only I mean not only are you dead buried and risen with him but you are you are f you are so empowered by his grace that you're literally freed from sin and you know most people think that they've got dual natures inside of them you got you've got all this stuff you've got this problem inside of you you've got issues and stuff and God's like no I freed you from all of that mm -hmm. reckon it so. Reckon it so and live according, live as the saint that I made you in my son. Mm -hmm. And then I, I find that absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't imagine anything, any greater news that you could, you could hear to light your fire, to make, it, to, to make your, this, this life that he's, this eternal life that he's given you more real in your walk every day. I don't know how God could be more intimate, intimately close to you than to be one with you in mm -hmm. you his life manifest in you mm -hmm. coming out of you mm -hmm. having the resurrection power in yeah. your life that you can appropriate and use it to be able to overcome all the temptations and the problems of this world to endure with all all suffering with absolute joy and praise to god for everything despite how bad the circumstances might be i can't imagine any greater news greater than that or maybe God giving you everything. He's literally giving you all things, all spiritual blessings in this life, and then in the life to come, He's literally, literally giving you everything along with because you're a joint heir with the Son. Right. I mean, what more good news can you possibly want to wake up and want to, <laughs> to praise God with absolute yeah. joy for everything He's done for you, man? Yeah. <laughs> chill <laughs> chill <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to take a nap after this is over yeah um, I don't, again I don't hear any apathy there <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay all right let me get in the comments well here. you know you talk about I, apathy sometimes you share that information with people and you're and you're greeted with apathy yeah yeah and that's what I scratch my head at yeah you know have you ever seen this? No, not particularly. Well, you know, here it is, and, and you look at them, and it's like, so? Right, right. I don't, don't get, you get that. get it? Yeah, right. I don't right. get that. Uh, all right. Hey, we got Persis in the house. How you doing? Amy Stewart says, uh, when Paul talks about the gospel of Christ, a lot of people seem to think that is the same gospel that Christ himself preached during his earthly ministry. Is this uh, one reason for a lot of confusion? Well, it could be. There's a lot of confusion because you got a lot of pastors not rightly dividing. Um, 
I actually saw this uh, article. That reminds me. I saw this article. It's terrible. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, this guy was actually defending the idea of um, of uh, being a uh, red letter Christian. Um, you know, he says uh, the um, a red letter Christian is a strange concept to me. He says, "Well, he's he's showing a meme." Mm-hmm. Because aside from a few verses in Acts and Revelation, the red letters basically end after the Gospels. Paul and the other apostles almost never quote the red letters. You know what they do quote a lot? The Old Testament. (laughs) He says, which Jesus also quoted a lot. The first red letter Christians were actually called uh, Marcionites and were expelled from the church as heretics or whatever. And so he makes the case here. What's, What's the point of reading Paul or anybody else? Why not just follow the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself because he was God incarnate. Is it, does it, wouldn't that make his words more important? Shouldn't you just follow that? Don't you get everything you need in just that alone? What do you need all that other stuff for? Well, that's a big mixed understanding of what, <laughs> of what all that other stuff is. That's right. You, you know, I was that's thinking, right. you know, 1 you know, first, first Corinthians 15, Paul said, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Right. How did he receive it? What did he receive? <laughs> he said it's the gospel here. Right. What gospel is it that he received and who did he receive it from? Right. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel <laughs> of the grace of God. It's the gospel of our salvation. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Paul, uh, I, what was it? Uh, and it's, by the way, it's in black letter. It's not red letter. That's, that's right. Uh, Although he said he received it. Yeah. Uh, what was it was the first Corinthians fourteen thirty seven. Mm-hmm. The things that I write unto you are the, are the commandments, commandments of the Lord. God. Yeah. You know. So essentially, uh, all of uh, Paul's letters really ought to be read. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, red lettered, uh, and it totally misunderstands the entire program of God. You just sort of have this hysterical narrow view, narrow view mm-hmm. of the of the of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, without understanding the context of it all. Understanding the point and the reason for it all, the, the even considering how it was all set up before we even get to the Gospels, the promises that were made to the people of Israel about the land, about the kingdom, the king to come, and the redeemer that would come through the seed of Eve. And then, once you understand all of the prophecies about that literal kingdom here on earth and then christ shows up and they're all talking about how the kingdom is at hand well then you understand exactly what the context is and that the fact that you know the you'd say in john four twenty two, you have salvation is of the jews the it was through the jews that they would be the instrument of god's blessing to the world it was through his his kingdom of priests that the world would hear the good news about the messiah and get saved so the, if it was necessary for the Jews first to become saved so that God could implement his kingdom here on earth and they could be the, the prophesied kingdom of priests that God had always wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. And it was through the Jews the world, would, the world would find salvation. But they rejected their Messiah. They were given a second chance at Pentecost, which they also rejected. Mm-hmm. It was in that moment that God could have, should have, they should have gone straight into Daniel's 70th week. Mm-hmm. And the yep. and the uh, that's but what Peter said was happening. Yeah, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. But something strange happened. Mm-hmm. Some guy named Saul gets saved. Yeah, God reveals to him a mystery, which is something completely different than what had been proclaimed before. Yep. Paul's not going around saying, "Yeah, salvation's of the Jews," and oh, by the way, the kingdom is here. Mm-hmm. Paul's saying, "Yeah, except mm-hmm. by faith in Christ is." And his death, burial, and resurrection for all your sins and you get saved. This is a message for everybody. There is no more any difference between Jew and Greek. He is revealing something that had never been proclaimed before Mm -hmm. him. A secret hid from ages and from generations, but now made manifest. I can remember in Bible college discussing with uh, different people the difference about what was being preached by the apostles and what was being preached by Paul himself. Right. And I would point out, of course, Acts chapter 3 and Romans 16, you know, and, and you have the apostles, you know, preaching that which had been declared by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And Paul's saying, I'm telling you what's been kept secret since the world began. <laughs> exactly. And, and yeah. you know, you... I love that contrast. You know, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful contrast. And, yeah. I said, and I said, please, and I would ask the question, please tell me how these are the same thing. Right. Right. And, of course, normally they trump something up or just basically scratch their head. Right. But things different cannot be the same. Right. Right. Um, so I guess the answer, Amy Stewart, is uh, let's just blame it on the devil. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Persa says, uh, oh, she's giving the gospel to DJ. How nice. DJ asks, uh, will all people eventually believe in Christ? Well, every well, I would now, I would say yes. Yeah, not ev- right. Eventually, not all people will be saved, but every knee it will bow. bow and every tongue right. shall confess whether they believed in him exactly. or not i was going to say the same thing yeah. right uh, i mean once you're once you're freed from that sin corrupted body uh, yeah you're going to know what the truth is yeah. <laughs> and when you're standing before god at the great mm-hmm. white throne you're going to kneel mm-hmm. you're going to absolutely kneel yeah uh do you think that the moment when all of us when every all of we're all going to bow and kneel to him is going to be at the great white throne or do you think it means that all of us will eventually, at some point in our uh, lives, we will all kneel? I would think that the first time that I'm directly in the presence of God himself, that I'll I would kneel. be on your knees? Yeah. yeah. You think you're going to be on your knees in the air during the rapture? <laughs> how, does that, how does that work, brother? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Uh, Lori Howell is in the house. Great to see you. Great to see you. Um, uh, but no, uh, and, and I suspect that the heart of that question with DJ would have to be, you know, universalism and universal salvation. And no, of course not. You have, uh, uh, isn't it in Revelation? Um, um, uh, where's it at here? Um, oh no, maybe it was Revelation 11. Um, Oh, hang on here. I got to see here what the... uh, um, I'm having a little trouble. Uh, um, All those in the lake of fire will be... Okay, so here's what we know about the, the lake of fire. Have you ever read Revelation 20, 11 to 15? You know, death and hell cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the lake of fire is, I mean, Revelation 20 is probably one of the more terrifying verses. Mm -hmm. Um, The, uh, uh, all the souls that are, all the unbelievers described in that passages in Revelation 20, they're, they're already guilty. They were already declared guilty by God, and basically the great white throne would be the sentencing phase, uh, the degree of, of punishment that they would encounter, and they will be judged according to their works. All those in the lake of fire will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm-hmm. And of course, those who um, might make a lot of, there are many who make a lot of false claims to make these verses somehow go away. You know, nobody can understand the book of Revelation. Joel, come on, man. The problem isn't that people can't understand it. The problem is that they won't believe it. If yeah. God says he's going to set up a great white throne and he's going to judge the dead, then he's going to set up a great white throne and he's going to judge the dead. So the mm-hmm. question becomes, you look at that, how will you measure up in judgment before right. righteous and holy God? Mm-hmm. Because there's a group of unbelievers that are going to be mm-hmm. spending eternity yeah. in a lake of fire. Yeah. So if it's an allegorical book, is the great white throne also meant to be some type of allegory? (laughs) It's not an allegory meant to reveal a spiritual truth of some kind. Or an actual truth, you know. (laughs) You know, but again, you know, Revelation 21 says that, you know, all these unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and all that type shall have their part in the Mm -hmm. lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right, right. So... Uh, is that an allegorical death? Right. How do you explain uh, one of the, um, was it Revelation uh, 14.9? Uh, uh, you have the messages of the three angels here. Um, 
And uh, you have the uh, angel, third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, <laughs> Nor worship the be- uh, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark in his name. Yeah, you have in Second uh, Thessalonians one. Um, I was going to say I have had some people say, "Well, it's the smoke of their torment that ascends forever and ever." Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. They're no longer tormented, but the smoke is still there. I suppose you could argue that well, he's only talking about people during the tribulation. There, you know, some of, it doesn't matter. You got eternal torment going on. Yeah. For these unbelievers yeah. who have taken the mark, you have Second uh, Thessalonians one nine. Who's the unbel- When the, you have, an, uh, he's talking about the second coming of Christ in verse eight, mm-hmm. in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey, obey not him. the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So. I mean, Pastor Howell would say, hey, look, there's nothing ambiguous about these, no, ver- about these nothing verses. Nothing ambiguous about these that. These people who refuse to obey the gospel, which is they refuse to believe what God asked them to believe, they're going to be mm. punished with everlasting destruction. Mm. Um, and, I, of course, there is not a universalist on the planet that doesn't go to that verse and say that everlasting is not everlasting. Really? Really? How can they be? Yeah, there, I, if if you take the King James Bible and read it for what it says, right? That's what it says. Right, right. Everlasting destruction right. is everlasting destruction, right. unless wow. everlasting isn't everlasting. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, whatever answer do they have for that? I know exactly. Well, that would be my question. Yeah. How could you possibly answer but, that? As I've said many times in the past, I would, I would do, all, I would do anything but violate truth in order to become a universalist. Right. I would love to be a universalist. Right. I can't think of a doctrine that I would more readily embrace. Right. Is everybody. the universal salvation of every single person. Right. Just take care of Second Thessalonians chapter one for me, <laughs> and and, the, and no one ever has. Right. 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 Except to come and say, oh, it says everlasting, but it doesn't mean everlasting. Right. Every single one of them, even the contemporary ones, will tell you the same thing. Wow. Um, uh, so we got uh, Persis, uh, payment for everyone's sin was paid at the cross. Uh, only those who appropriate it by grace through faith will be saved. Praise the Lord. Yep. Love that. Uh, I like to say that the gift, the, the benefit of a gift rejected is no gift at all. Uh, DJ asks, is faith something I must do, or does God give it to me? Well, there you, there's a question. Uh, Pastor Howe, uh, you might uh, find interesting, uh, when he was growing up, mm-hmm. he was a zero-point Calvinist, went to, a Bible mm-hmm. college with a, yeah. went to a Bible college with a King James Bible, came out a five-pointer with a New American Standard, <laughs> and then he studied his way out of Calvinism. Uh, what do you say to that? Is faith something we must do, or does God give it to me? Well, it depends on your... Definition of do. First of all, faith is not a work. But the, I've heard this discussion. It's not our faith. It's God's faith, and fa- God gives you the faith. Well, if that's the case, then it's not my faith. <laughs> you know, it, you know. Take you know something as simple as Romans chapter four: "To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness." Amen. Uh, I love these questions, DJ. No yep. problem at all. Bring it. Bring it, yep. brother. Uh, he does say later, um, uh, absolutely not a Calvinist, and that he is, a, I believe, in mid ex dispensationalism. Mm-hmm. Those are great questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, bring it. Um, right. Get your best shot, brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Christy Lightfritz is in the house. Great to see you. Um, uh, Justin says amen to that, Lori. Much needed every day. That's right. Um, uh, Lourdes, uh, a lot of folks are engaging uh, DJ and Valerie sitting there going, who got Joel started? I know. Uh, Justin Cox says, "I got, God said it. I believe it. 
Bye, all. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, uh, Valerie quotes Romans 2.16, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, How is it that, that God shall judge the secrets of men by Christ according to my gospel? Does that mean that people will be held accountable to their response to Paul's gospel when they are judged at the... Uh, great white throne so that when when Paul says those who obey not the gospel it is I would say uh, what he's <laughs> Paul's gospel was much much more detailed than just Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures it, there was a lot of good information in there right and a part of of his good news is God is going to ha- hold all men accountable right uh-huh. He is going to judge the secrets of men. That's a part of God of Paul's good news. Right. God will hold all men accountable. Right. I uh, love that, Pastor. Uh, Valerie says, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. And she quotes verse 3. Uh, for I delivered unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Well, here you go, Pastor. Uh, here's a common question. Um, sorry for a softball, but a lot of people will say, well, now, wait a minute. If Paul's revealing something new, why does he say here, you know, my gospel was according to the scriptures? How does that work? <laughs> uh, well, again, I'll go back to First uh, Corinthians 15. You read it. Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that I also received, how that who? Christ. Christ. Died. We just went back to the gospels in the Old Testament. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that was always the purpose of God. If the point right. was, uh, and the point of, of, of Paul's special mystery preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ was what was not understood by all of that information. Right, right. Doesn't mean that it's not founded and based in that information. Right, exactly. So basically, the fact that Christ would die on that cross buried rose again was no secret no that 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 was that was according to prophecy fulfilled in the lord jesus christ yeah. what was a secret was the means by which that would become a uh uh the good news at uh, the way that we can right. become saved right. and have eternal life in this age yeah. of grace yeah well peter's that, and early early acts they certainly weren't preaching the cross as good news no right you with wicked hands have taken and crucified him that's right you know and he, he talked he you know he was killed but he was Raised to sit on the throne of David. Right. Right. You know, that's totally different than what Paul said, that he was raised for our justification. Yeah. Uh, Persia says, uh, what did the Lord know in Matthew 24, Acts 1? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the things, I, one of the ways I look at those, at those passages is, you know, he often said... Well, he periodically said, you know, when he spoke to the people and he spoke to the disciples, they were the words of the Father given to him. Mm -hmm. They were the words that the Father taught him, the words that his Father, he doeth the works, he said. Mm -hmm. And so when Christ spoke, he was speaking the words of the Father. Did Mm -hmm. the Father know at the time Christ spoke those words Mm -hmm. about the age of grace? You know he did. Mm -hmm. The true author of those words is the Father, and the Father knew about grace when he spoke. Uh, it's not until you see Christ, you know, praying to the Father directly that you really see Christ thinking, you know, speaking his own words to his own Father. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, you know, and so in those, in Matthew 24 and especially Acts 1, the true author of those words was the Father and the Father knew. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Um, so I find I find that kind of a question fascinating. Mm-hmm. And how much did Christ know? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I remember Hal telling me a long time ago, and I would agree with this. If I, you know, if okay, so you got the Father. The Father's got everything planned out from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. He knows everything. He knows what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. He knows how it's going to play out. He could predict with precision the very details of everything that's going to take place at his crucifixion. I mean, they could tell you about his yeah. none of his bones are going to be broken. All this stuff. I mean. So God knows everything from the end from the beginning. Well, if your father knows that, I would personally choose to not know some things just so you have that, you're, you're in the moment and you get surprised by how things play out every mm-hmm. once in a while. And you can operate on faith in the father knowing he already knows how it's all going to play out. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I would want to do that about some things, not maybe not about everything, but Christ clearly yeah. knew many many things yeah. about the future mm-hmm. about the, you know israel how mm-hmm. it's all going to play out all this stuff yeah. but every yeah. once in a while yeah. I'd, I'd be yeah. like i don't want to know but then also it's very very clear from scripture that in taking on human form being made in the likeness of men that the an omniscient god became a person that also had to learn <laughs> exactly he had to learn obedience. How else could he identify? How else could right. he identify with our lack of knowledge without experiencing it and right. choosing to experience it? Right. But it tells you very clearly in the Gospels that that he learned experience he, that he had obedience. to grow in right. grow in wisdom, right. as well as in stature. Yeah, I think. Uh, I think the uh, tempting in the wilderness was the mm. test run, and the yeah. actual test was yeah. the agony in the garden. Yeah. You know, the, and that that experience of learning obedience, mm-hmm. learning learning obedience through suffering, it taught him. You know, mm-hmm. he was as tempted as much as he could possibly, and he had to follow mm-hmm. the word of God itself through that yeah. ordeal. Yeah. And you know, he can understand the meaning of mm-hmm. it all, and he understood yeah. it intellectually, but he hadn't experienced yeah. it. You know. Thus you see the depth of the truth where it said he was tempted at all points, yeah. like as we are. Yeah. Now, either that is true <laughs> or it's not. Exactly. I happen to believe that it's, it's true. true right? It said that he was tempted at <laughs> all right. points like as we are. He, he experienced the full panorama right. of human experience, yet without sin. sin. Right. I love that. You got you got more? Are you fired up? Come on. You want to give me a little more? <laughs> Preach it to me, man. Uh, Valerie says, uh, Christ quotes the Old Testament Psalms and prophetic scriptures. That's all mm. there was, showing Israel who he is. Um, and if you go to Supply of Grace, I've got an article on the uh, tempting in the wilderness. And one of my favorite aspects of the temptation in the wilderness is the fact that God, the Lord, and Satan are both quoting back and forth to each other. Mm-hmm. The words of Moses, yeah, in the in his spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, it's if you really think about it, it's really, mm. really fascinating how Moses is at the center of their argument mm-hmm. and in the center of that temptation. And I just, I love the fact that they were quoting quoting Moses. So you got to dig into that. That's that's a really that's a whole lot of fun. Um, Valerie says, "Oh, I think I got that. Um, I like the scruffy look today, brother Joel. Thank you." Uh, David Reed uh, actually called me after the podcast on Friday, was it? Hmm. Or was it Thursday? And he's like, Joel, hey, Joel, if next time you shave, you want to try to bring the razor closer to your face because <laughs> you're missing, like, huge parts of your face. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. man, I love him. Uh you got something? No, well, I was just thinking in that in that context about the the battle over the words. You notice when when uh, when Satan tempted him, and he said, "You know, command the stones to be made bread." Yes. And yes. the and the res- the response: It is written, "Man shall not live right. by bread alone, right. but right. by every word, word right. Right. Exactly. that proceedeth out." And Lucifer <laughs> was good at cherry picking verses. <laughs> And so was God. Yeah, he was he was good at picking this. And you know, and that ver- if I remember right, that verse he's quoting was mm-hmm. what Moses told the people when they were when they were uh, uh, hungry in the wilderness, yeah. and uh, because they were learning through obedience mm-hmm. to follow every word of God. Yeah, you know, and you know, and it was always a yeah. question for me growing up uh, was, well, okay, now wait a minute, what if if the 
what would have been so wrong to turn those rocks into bread and just eat it? If you're hungry, you're the son of God. Don't you have the right to do it? No, 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 no. This was part of the father's plan for him to learn obedience through the things he suffered. Yeah. It, was God, it was not God, the father's will that he, that he eat during that period because he wanted him to be as weak and vulnerable as possible to experience the depths and the extremes of temptation as much as he could possibly experience. Mm. In that, in that moment, I would say. So it would have been a sin for uh, Christ to have taken those rocks and turned them into, into bread or food of some kind because he would have been betraying the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet you money Satan knew that. Satan knew there was a point and a reason for his suffering mm -hmm. in that wilderness, and he knew he had an opportunity yeah. there. Well, there was a precedent also set. I mean, there, the old covenant under the old system, obedience was central. Right. I mean, think about it. Here's Moses. The people are grumbling. We're thirsty. God says, go speak to that rock. <laughs> right. What did Moses do? He hit the rock. He struck the rock with his rod. Right. Did, did the children of Israel get water to drink? <laughs> yes. Yes. But what was the consequence to Moses? Oh, uh, yeah. He didn't go into the promised land. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, again, um, the Lord Jesus Christ, my, my, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me right you know he was obedient to the father right um now the full context of what moses said to the nation of israel that the lord had quoted there was deuteronomy 8 3 he said and he humbled and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna mm -hmm. which thou knewest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Mm -hmm. And there was a point of reason for that hunger and the suffering of the Jews in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And the Lord suffered his people to be hungered and to, to be humbled and to hunger in the wilderness so that, they can know, so, so that they will know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the mm -hmm. Lord. And this goes back to the point of why Christ fasted too. Mm -hmm. He too would suffer humiliation, mm -hmm. hunger, and he too would learn through experience in human flesh that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every yeah. word that proceeds right. out of the mouth of God. He suffered to learn obedience experientially and reliance upon the word alone, just like his people did. Yeah. And Jesus, yeah. and the point that I loved was that Jesus never forced his people to go through something he would have been unwilling to go through himself, right. which is amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. And all the humiliation and the hunger that Jesus went through was, was really worse than anything yeah. the Jews ever went through in the yeah. wilderness. And yet they didn't learn their lesson. Right, you know, right. For instance, thou shalt not live except by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Right. And, and yet you reach a period of time. You know, here's a verse that gets cherry picked a lot. Right. And I like this verse, but he said where there no where there is no vision, the people perish. Yes, that's right. I forgot about that verse. Well yeah. what what vision was he talking he was talking about the vision of the prophets. All right. And uh, when when Israel was so in rejection right. against God and what he was doing, God no longer gave sight to the prophets right in other words the prophets were not receiving words from god mm -hmm. and because of that how were the people perishing were they per perishing in a, in a physical sense or in a spiritual sense yes yeah because there was physical retribution due to unbelief but there was also spiritual retribution because they were not receiving every word that proceeded from the mouth of god right, right. i love that mm -hmm. i can't top that so i'm gonna move on uh, <laughs> uh, scripture inspired. Okay, so Christ did know the future, but couldn't uh, quote what the disciples had written. But he knew, he knew it would be written. He didn't. Well, he knew most of the future. Uh, he didn't know when his second coming was going to be, and he said that uh, a couple of times. And uh, you know, only the Father knows. I, only He knows. Um, inspired by, but in any event, uh, Hillary says, but he knew it would be written scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit and also revealed to Paul, John, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one. I um, love that. Thank you very much. Valerie says, they, they will all see Christ at the great white throne judgment. I suspect that that every knee would bow goes back to the great white throne. I suspect we'll all, the, all, of, all of creation is going to be there. Uh, and all of humanity going all the way back to Adam and Eve, and we're all going to bow. Uh, I remember David Reed gave a good case um, in one of his videos about the body of Christ actually being at the great white throne. Uh, you'd have to go to, 
you know, Columbus Bible Church uh, YouTube channel, and I guess look up Great White Throne or something like that. Uh, if you don't um, come to believe in the Great White Throne, God will deal with it, I guess. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you'll believe in it when you're kneeling. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, actually, the I suspect the very moment you die, you're gonna be, you're gonna probably know truth. You're gonna be like, oh no, I really screwed that up. Um, believe now is better than later. Valerie says, love it. Um, what else do we have here? Valerie says, faith comes by hearing the word. So both uh, God gave us the word to believe. Yeah, and I remember when I was young, I made the mistake of thinking, well, all you got to do is quote to people the word of God, and they're gonna they're gonna believe because it it makes them it makes them have faith. Oh no, yeah. it means mm -hmm. that the only faith you know true faith comes from believing in the word of God, which is a choice the individual makes. Right. But that's the only way to have faith is yeah. to is to believe the word of God yeah. because it's the it's the that's the thing that you're that is is causing you to to choose to have faith. Will is all will is always the question. Right. In other words, what about provision? Right. Well, provision for justification is universal. Right. Application is limited. Limited upon what? Right. Um, the word of God, its its accessibility, its availability right. is universal. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but it, but it yeah. still requires appropriation. Yeah, I lo I love that. Uh, give and take relationship, free will, secrets, heart. God knows our hearts, according to the Scripture. Three days there, three days nights. Uh, He's got Jonah. I think he meant Jonah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, yeah, she corrected it. Hey, we got Anita in the house. How you doing? Hi, all pastors. Uh, oh, hi, all Pastor Hal, Pastor Joel. On the, on the road to Michigan from uh, visiting uh, Annapolis. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, love you, Anita. So great to have you here. Bob Picard quotes John 20. 8 to 9, then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he said, and believed, for as yet they know not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Um, I got a, um, I've got a really big article, of, uh, I think it's, oh, I think it's tomorrow, tomorrow's the, um, tomorrow there's an article coming out about three days in the tomb, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, the tomb three days later, forgive me. Um, and uh, there's an interesting question to be asked about that passage um, that you quoted, which I which I really loved. Then when it also you know first came, he saw and believed. For as uh, they knew not the scripture, um, uh, let me see here if I can find that. All right. So you consider, for example. Um, uh, Matthew 27, let's see, make sure, make sure I get the right, you know, come into the place of, uh, okay, so, you know, you're looking at, I, I was, in the article I'm looking at what the, what the guards had said, uh, after, after it, uh, after all of the events in the, in, at the tomb, and you have the guards saying in Matthew 27, 62, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, so 6 p.m. on Thursday, for us 6 p.m. on Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate. Oh, this is where they asked for the guards, forgive me. Saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest... His disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. And Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Mm -hmm. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, uh, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now here's a question. And one of the questions I had in the article, and you, you tell me if I got this wrong. <laughs> My question was, how is it that these unbelieving Pharisees understood the Lord's claim that he would, that he'd be resurrected, and yet that truth was hidden from the 12 disciples? I can answer that question. I know you can. <laughs> I, you, what, what can't you answer? Maybe Judges 11 or something. And Luke 18, well, and, just, and just for the sake of context here, Luke 18, the Lord would tell his disciples of his death and resurrection for a third time. 
right? Mm -hmm. And you have in Luke 18, 31, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. And he tells them, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, shall mm -hmm. be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spitted on, yeah. and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day rise again. And then you read in Luke 18, 34, There's And the they understood none of these things. Why? And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. All right. Because it was hidden. Right. Why would be my question. The Pharisees understood what he meant there. Why didn't the disciples? And even more important, why were these sayings hid from them? What's the point of the Lord saying these things to the disciples only for those truths to be hidden from them? You'll have to ask God about that. <laughs> who was it that who who is it that hid, hid it from them? <laughs> Um, now, I had uh, yeah, countered... Remember, there's other passages that talk about, finally, they remembered what was spoken to right. them. Right. And now, so it was brought to their memory later. Right. Now, you tell me if, the, if you totally disagree with this or not. I found um, an answer to that question in... Um, a, pos a potential answer to that question in Baker's Understanding the Gospels. And he said that, if the disciples did not believe that Jesus was going to arise from the dead, any charge by the Jews that they stole the body out of the tomb to make it appear that he had risen from the dead would carry no weight at all. That makes a lot of sense to me, mm -hmm. right? So I suspect that they knew that he said those things, but they didn't fully understand the meaning of what he said, and thus they didn't believe it. So you can't be a believer if you don't understand what's being said. Okay. In fact, uh, you have in uh, John 28 about Peter and John visiting the tomb. John arrived at the first mm -hmm. of the tomb, didn't go in, but the verse says he saw and believed. Mm -hmm. Right? So he, he knew the Lord talked about his resurrection but didn't understand what he was yeah. saying and he didn't believe it until he actually saw the empty clothes in the empty tomb but by hiding those sayings from his disciples they would the the point is by hiding those sayings from the disciples they would never be anywhere near the tomb and there nobody can make an accusation yeah. against them about stealing the body right well, i would also suggest that the context speaks to their misunderstanding yeah again all right the lord He's killed. He's in the tomb three days. He's right. raised from the dead. We see all of the events that take place after that. We right. read early Acts that uh, uh, after 40 days, for 40 days, they were instructed of the Lord of things concerning the kingdom. Right. What's the question? Right. What are they asking? Yeah. Will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Right. And so... <laughs> And in Luke 18, they're not thinking in the context of death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. I mean, the princes of this world didn't understand what was going to happen, because if they had, they wouldn't have done it. They didn't have a full understanding of it. They were thinking in the context of, of, the, of the Lord going into his kingdom. They were right. thinking about the establishment of the kingdom. Right. They were, they were, right. it, it, it just... The information was framed outside their frame of reference. Right. I mean, you think they are so excited about the Messiah being there. They're so focused on that kingdom. They're just like, there's no way you're going to die. There's, there, there's no way, dude. Mm -hmm. There's no way. You're here. The prophecies are here, dude. There's no way you could die. Yeah. They, they could not accept yeah. something. No matter how often he told them, they couldn't right. fathom that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that, Pastor. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Cliff says, not being quiet today. I'm being silenced. Uh, pretty sad when my cell phone has uh, no long distance and my home phone is totally dependent on flaky internet cable. <laughs> 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 no worries, dude. Love you, man. You totally missed an epic talk about Calvinism a few minutes ago. Uh, Valerie says, uh, let's see here. Christ had to suffer to be able to raise again, to be able to fulfill the scriptures as well as hide the mystery from Satan. Love that. Uh, this generation shall not pass. Jesus was fully man and fully God. Love that. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, I love his incarnation, Persis, and don't get me started. <laughs> I love his incarnation. Uh, I, got a, I had a big, um, a big uh, article on that, too, on Supply of Grace. Um, he was expounding on end times. He says that's right. Uh, uh, DJ says, if I misinterpret the words eternal and forever, will I lose out on any rewards at the Bema Seat? I'll ask. You, I'll say that. Again. I'll throw this at you, uh, Pastor Hal. If uh, DJ asks, 
If I misinterpret the words eternal and forever, will I lose out on any rewards at the Bema Seat? Yeah, well, that's yeah. possible. Yeah, absolutely. I would say any time that we live in contrary to sound doctrine, that you're not going to get gold, silver, and precious stone, but wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, Valerie says they knew not the scriptures, too busy uh, fishing. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. She quotes John 29, right, mm -hmm. which is right after that John 28 verse I quoted. Uh, a person says, Joel, thank you for asking. I'm doing well, and it is well with my soul. We sang that yesterday at church. Mm -hmm. yes, I'm we enjoying do. you, your very well-written book very much. Um, if I ever go up to Chicago, I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to hug you big. Uh, Valerie says, if the body was stolen, then why would they waste time to unwrap him? <laughs> yeah. Ew, who would want to do that? That's a yeah. great point. I love that. Yeah. And fold the napkin. Exactly. Well, yeah. the, the disciples were neat freaks, right? <laughs> mm. Well, some people would accuse them of misdirection. <laughs> yes, very true. There, mm. There's a logical reason for it. Mm. Um, I mentioned Josh Strelecki's article on adoption. Got to quote that real quick. We got 15 minutes left. Um, uh, adoption Adoption is a subject I love also He's got a big here uh, is A really short article Called Adoption The Height of the Father's Love and Grace um, I'll just go to the end of the article here uh, He says Adoption to us is the end game But with God It was what he predestinated Love that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, uh, that was a point that uh, first time I ever really got to sit down with David Reed, we were at the Big Easy. Uh, we had that big meal there. And, uh, and I remember David was really challenging me on predestination. And he's like, don't you think adoption was the end game of predestination? Because it's the, to wit the redemption of your body. It's talking, mm -hmm. talking about the rapture there. I'm like, that's a really good point. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Um, uh, Dave's, yeah. Dave is good like that. But he says, uh, Josh Trelecki says, adoption under Roman law secured for the adopted child a right to the name and to the property of the person by whom he had been adopted. Mm -hmm. He says, at the moment of adoption, the child had, a, had the legal right to claim all things of the father as a son or daughter. At the same time, Roman law granted to the person that adopted all rights and privileges of a father. Adoption is not the issue of nature, but rank and status along with all the privileges that come with it. Thus, adoption is the highest expression of God's love. Adoption is the glory of his grace, and us receiving the adoption of sons is to the praise of the glory of his grace. Mm -hmm. uh, we came back where we started. Yeah. Uh, what a nice coincidence. Adoption is God's grace to us to share in all glory mm -hmm. he gave to his son, the heir mm -hmm. of all things before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Adoption is... Giving to us something that only rightfully belongs to him and giving it to us in his good pleasure. For mm. those in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance in the fullest sense in accord with mm -hmm. what God predestinated. Thus, we possess a good and blessed hope through grace. Mm. I cannot wait for God to show off the exceeding riches of his grace toward those whom he has adopted in his kindness mm. through Christ Jesus. Right. Now, do you think that... Uh, when Paul says, you know, the adoption to with the redemption of our bodies, uh, that the that the rapture of the church is the moment when the adoption is fulfilled mm -hmm. and the inheritance given, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why adoption is so closely tied to uh, basically the rapture and the end game of it all, because it's the fulfillment of this uh, right. inheritance, really. Yeah. Well, again, it's, coming it's, out coming out of the ref the reformed uh, way of thinking. Right. <laughs> Again, as as I listen to people that supposedly taught right division, some would actually say that under the old program, they needed to experience the new birth, and, and we were adopted into the body, mm. which, I, which I found to be confusing, mm. which is really not what Paul's talking about when he talks about adoption. Right. Uh, adoption is, is something that is predestinated. Mm. We are not predestinated to believe. Right. We are predestinated to be uh, adopted. Right. That's the reason Paul tells us, he says, we have the spirit of adoption. Right. He said that we're waiting for, for the, the adoption. adoption. Right. So on the one hand, he says, we're sealed to it. It's promised to it. Mm. We don't have it yet. Mm. And 
And yet, when he, he treats us as if we're to live as if we possess it already. Right. When you get into Ephesians and, and the other you know, uh, uh, epistles where you see a fuller revelation of that, what we know and understand. Mm. But yes, we're predest predestination has to do with the hope of the believer, yeah. not the fact that he became a believer. Yeah. It, God foreknew that we would trust God. He foreordained that we should believe the gospel, but he doesn't foreordain that we believe the gospel. Mm. He foreordained that we should believe the gospel. If we do believe the gospel, then he predestinates the, the end result of that, which is our eternal security, our hope, our, our blessed hope, as we would say, our eternal inheritance, the redemption of our body, it's the embodiment of everything that he promised to those who are in his son. I want more. <laughs> Keep preaching. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. Fine. Fine. Then. All right. Let's see here. What else we got? We've got uh, uh, Valerie says, wrapped, uh, wrapped napkin to a Jewish boy means I will be back. It's a custom. <laughs> Um, the big easy fried okra. Yep, I got all kinds of. I, I didn't. I've got tons of archaeological stuff here. I could tell you all about the uh, all about the uh, diets of gladiators back in Paul's day. <laughs> 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 they ate lots of plants. That was the big news there. Uh, Lori says so. Hindsight being twenty twenty started with them. Praise the Lord. Right. Uh, okra ick. I love a. I love fried okra. It is. It is phenomenal. I totally. That's that's some good stuff there. Uh, Shroud of Turin, a joke. Yes, it is totally. And by the way, Ellen, great to have you here. We're going to keep praying for you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> All right, Pastor. How how do we get that free gift of eternal life? Well, thinking about some of the subject matter we've been discussing today, and our discussions about uh, the tribulation and the and the end time. Uh, if someone's listening to me that doesn't know that they have eternal life, uh, we as believers look forward to an event, and that's when Christ shall appear. Because when he appears, then I'm going to appear with him in glory. Amen. If, let's say that happens tonight. Amen. Wouldn't that, <laughs> wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be great? Yep. What happens for the unbeliever tomorrow? And uh, the Bible is very clear about the timetable of prophecy. And there is a period of time coming. And if you don't go with us, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, you are going to live through a period of time which the Scripture calls a tribulation. He says he's going <laughs> to, he said, there shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, never shall be. Can you imagine being an unbeliever going into the tribulation and suffering the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan and all, all of those things that we find described uh, in the book of Revelation? And then on top of that, <laughs> then your only hope is hell itself. Well, and <laughs> personally, that's not a choice I would rather, that's not one that I would want to make. Amen. The, the fact is, God says, that the gift of God is eternal life. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth for a specific reason, to be the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. He died for the whole world, but more importantly, he died for me. Amen. He died for you. Amen. Because all of sin had come short of the glory of God. Yet God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul said the good news was how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And based upon all of that, even though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when you trust Christ as your Savior, when you put your faith and your confidence in what he did for you, he gives you the gift of eternal life, he gives you the gift of righteousness, and he gives to you a hope so that you don't worry about the wrath to come, whether it's seven years of tribulation or hell itself, mm -hmm. because the gift of God is eternal life. Mm. No rocket science involved. God says, I have a gift. Here it is. 
what should be the response, but thank, thank you, you, Lord, I receive your gift. Please do that today if you don't know that you have eternal life and that you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. All right, how about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, um, how grateful we are to have Pastor Hal Beckemeyer here with us this morning. Uh, how grateful we are for Fred and Gwen also. Um, and uh, grateful that we're going to see Josh Trelecki on Friday. Mm. I'm excited about that, Father. Uh, I want them here, and maybe you could arrange the circumstances so they have to stay here an extra week or something. That'd be awesome. Um, Father, I just, we're just so grateful. We love, we love you. And, we, it, you know, the very thought of everything, the whole glory of your grace is cause enough for us to just be reminded that we are just so thankful for everything you've done for us in us and through us we're so grateful for the gift of your son that free gift of eternal life we're grateful for the the whole doctrine of identification our death burial and resurrection with christ everything you made us in your son and we're grateful for the adoption um i mm -hmm. father i just i honestly cannot put into words find the words to express the the immense gratitude i think we all feel for everything that you've done for us we're so, we love you and we are so grateful to you for it all and uh, father i just lift up all the saints in the live chat lift up all the subscribers to the channel the members of the church everybody we know and uh, i pray father that you know i'm grateful for these saints that we have not only here but also online uh, with the uh, podcast, I'm grateful for, you know, their testimony of faith and hope and love that we see in them. Um, I, you know, for all of them, I pray for grace in their lives, the grace of your son being with them, that they would be inspired by his grace, uh, filled with the wisdom of Solomon, you know, peace of Christ, the comfort of the spirit, the strengthening of the spirit. I also pray, Father, that, um, specifically for a number of people. Um, uh, we had Francis, Jonathan and Dino's wife, Chuyita, her son and girlfriend, uh, Persis, her physical needs, uh, Cliff Matthews and the ministry he has with his family, Bob Picard, his recovery. I pray he gets 100% better, and if he needs more time to recover, that's fine too, Father. He can just come down here. Uh, Connie Redmond, uh, Larry Dyer, uh, Grady and Alfreda Owens, uh, the Heineggers, Ellen Lorraine, uh, Jane Lisa Montero, all of the, the uh, pinch hitters that are coming in behind the pulpit uh, the, for while Hal is gone. Tom and Jay, maybe even Mike Moriarty, lift them all up. Uh, Sherry and Willie, Jake and Suzanne, Neil Marinoth and his family, Debbie Bridges, her family, Dave and Nancy Perry, uh, Tom and Dahlia, uh, John and Anita, whom we love, Mike and Renee, Renee's uh, neighbor Brenda uh, Horwood especially, and her brother Garth, and Marcy too. Uh, Larry Hines, uh, Betty Loud, Betty Jo Baum, um, Mary Beth Hunter, whom we love, Robin Scott, uh, Mike and Renee, I think I said that, Roger and Kate, uh, Devin, uh, Brian and Sonia, Randy and Ellen, and their son Peter. We especially lift them up, and especially Peter. I pray for grace in that whole circumstance. Um, the entire Light Fritz family, Mike, uh, uh, Mike Moriarty, my grace mate. Uh, pray that uh, for his family, um, Alice and Craig and their family, especially Mary um, uh, and uh, their neighbors, uh, Kay Diko, Inga, Lourdes, Lourdes, uh, Ukraine, uh, conflict, uh, and Inga's uh, grandbaby. Totally lift him up. Uh, Father, I just, uh, once again, I just pray uh, that we will, those who are suffering, they'll rejoice. They'll actually get to that place where they can rejoice in the sufficiency of your grace, your strength being made perfect in their weakness, and that them, and that the the suffering, their testimony as the suffering servant, showing the world around them the life of your Son in them, that that testimony will bring souls to be saved and saints edified. And I pray, Father, that in all these circumstances, as varied as they are, I pray that everything we do, we will glorify your Son, our Savior, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, we'll be back here tomorrow. I think it might be the Three Amigos tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Then we got some uh, uh, services Wednesday and then Friday morning. We're going to have Josh Trelecki here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep him on for hours and hours and hours. And then, uh, and then we're going to have him preaching here on Sunday, Sunday. At, for the main service. It's going to be totally epic. Yeah.
Um, All right, guys, you take good care. Have a truly bad day. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, uh, actually, let me go back here. Sorry, real quick. DJ says, thank you for answering my tough questions. Um, mm. I know you, you are... You are not disrupting the podcast. Yeah. It's awesome having you here. I actually love the questions. And uh, bring it. Come on. Come on back and join us. We, uh, we love having you here. And um, you take really good care of yourself. Yeah. All right. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care, guys. Bye.